All right. Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Douglas Humphrey, and I get to serve as the lead pastor here at Bridge Fellowship Church. And you can tell by the screen behind me that something different is happening today. We're starting a new sermon series from Mark's Gospel, and we're going to work to understand to see Jesus clearly, as in to see Jesus as he reveals himself in the scriptures. This entire sermon series is based on two questions that Jesus asked of his disciples while he was working with them. The first question is found in Mark chapter 8, verse 27. Jesus has been doing ministry work, and he stops, and he asks his disciples along the way. He says, who do people say that I am? And this question is a question that's geared towards people who are non-believers. This is geared towards what the, the, the clamor is in the, the town that they're serving in. Who do people say that I am? If Jesus had a Twitter feed, he would say, what's going on in my feed? What are people saying about me? And then Jesus makes it even more personal because he has these men called his disciples who have been walking with him and growing with him and doing ministry work with him. He turns right to one specific disciple. and He looks at Peter and he says, yeah, yeah, that's what they say. But who do you say that I am. You see, loved ones, how you answer that question says a lot about your faith. How you answer that question says a lot about how you view Jesus Christ. You see, it's one thing to be a new Christian, or maybe you're a non-believer still and not fully understand who Jesus is. But it's an entirely different thing when disciples, those of us who say we profess faith in Jesus Christ, when we don't know who he is. We're living in a time when people are claiming to be Christians, but the way that they live it betrays the faith that they say that they have. Back in my day, we would say people be fronting. <laughs> they think they know Jesus because they do Christian things. They think they know Jesus because they check all the Christian boxes. They, they go to church on Sunday. They go to small group. Their kids are in youth group. They give to the church financially. And when the mission trips roll around, they go on annual short-term mission trips. They act like, they look like, and they do the things that Christians do. But if you ask them some basic questions about Jesus Christ, if you ask them what is salvation and why is it necessary, if you ask them why is there evil in the world, if you ask them what happens after you die, or worse yet, if you ask them how are they going to respond when tragedy strikes, very few of them actually have a credible answer. And when I say credible, I'm talking about a biblical response. These people, when life happens to them, when they go through some hardships and some struggles, instead of leaning on Jesus, they have a crisis of faith. We see it all around media. We see it all around us. When the hard times hit, these people have a crisis of the faith. Some even go as far as to say they're going to deconstruct their faith. If you've been built up in Jesus Christ, how can you disassemble your faith? How is that possible? But more and more people are saying that it's time for us to deconstruct their faith. But here's the deal. If they've built their faith on Jesus Christ and his righteousness, there would be nothing to deconstruct because they would be standing tall and strong on their faith, because they put their faith in the God of the Bible, not some man-made 21st century spin on what church should look like. I said last week, and I'll say it again, Sunday morning worship isn't about us. Rather, it's about lifting high the name of Jesus Christ and serving each other. It's about singing praises, biblical truths back to God himself. It's about preaching biblical sermons from God's word. It's about engaging each other in discipleship. And so as we journey through Mark's gospel, I want us to walk away seeing Jesus more clearly than we ever have. Maybe through this journey, we're going to put on some spiritual eyeglasses and be able to see Jesus more clearly, more sharply than we ever have. God, in his sovereignty, has recorded everything that we need to know about Jesus so that we can relate to him the way he was designed to be related to as Lord and Savior. He's our Lord and he's also our Savior. And through that, God expects us to grow deeper in our faith in Jesus Christ. And so today we're going to work to start to understand who Jesus is as he reveals himself in Mark 1.1. I want to, to establish a foundation of knowledge regarding who Jesus is that we can build on for a lifetime. And so at this time, if you haven't done so already, I invite you to open your Bibles to Mark chapter 1, verse 1. That's where we're going to start. And as you're opening your Bibles to Mark chapter 1, verse 1, I want to give you our main idea. This is the, the, the central idea that we're going to hang the entire sermon on while we're together. And here it is. God prepared the way for you to receive the gospel before you knew what it was or even realized that you needed it. God in his sovereignty, 
God, in his foreknowledge, he prepared a way for you to receive the gospel before you knew what it was or even realized you needed it. It says in Mark 1.1, it says, this is the beginning of the gospel, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. You see, your salvation it isn't an afterthought. Mark wanted his readers to understand this from the get-go. Your salvation, our salvation, the salvation of the saints back then in, in Mark's day, it wasn't an afterthought. You're needing to be saved from your sins. You're needing to be saved from, from the death that you deserve from your sin. Didn't catch God by surprise. It wasn't like when your teacher, when you walked into the classroom, your teacher was like, okay, clear your desk. Tell you there's a pop quiz. And you're like, oh, but I didn't study. God wasn't like that. God isn't like that. God had a plan in place before time began that would ensure that he have a race of people that were committed to him, a nation of saints that lived for his glory, that delighted in serving his will. God didn't say, okay, you know, Adam and Eve, you messed up. Now I got to start all over again with a new plan. No, from day one, God wanted a race of people. I hope you know this. From day one, God wanted a race of people who were wholly sold out for his glory alone, that would worship him and live according to his will. And so from the very beginning, God had a plan named Jesus. That's what we see in verse number one. From the very beginning, God had a plan named Jesus, y'all. We know that in Genesis 3, man commits the first sin. They disobey God by eating from the forbidden tree. And as a result, sin enters into the world, and God's perfect creation is corrupted and tainted and broken by sin. And that perfect, loving relationship that Adam and Eve had with God is broken because they broke covenant with God and they lose their relationship with him. And now they have to pay for their sins with their own lives. Sin must be paid for. Your sin, it doesn't get canceled when you die. The other day I was talking to my mom. My, you guys know this. My dad passed away a little over a year and a half ago now. My mom was like, this credit card company keeps calling me, asking for some money. I said, mom, is your name on the credit card? She says, no. I said, don't worry about it. It cancels out when dad passed away. She said, I didn't know that. She'd been sending money every month to this credit card company. Felt so bad for her. You see, our, our sin doesn't just get canceled out when we die like credit card debt. No, 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 no. If Jesus doesn't pay for your sin with his atoning blood, then you know what happens? You pay for your sin with your atoning blood for eternity in hell. The only thing that saves you from having to repay your sin debt is by professing faith in Jesus Christ and then living for him. And God knew that the day would come when people, the people that he created, he knew the day that, that would come when the people that he made in his image and likeness, when they would rebel against him. And so being the omniscient, all-knowing God that he is, he devised a rescue plan to save all of humanity. And so at the appointed time, God himself would come down to us in the person of Jesus Christ. Being fully God and fully man, he would live a sinless life, obey the Father's will perfectly. And at the preordained time, he would lay his life down for you and I. When Jesus died, his blood covered all of humanity's sin, and all who believed in him, both past, present, and future people, would be saved from the punishment that they rightly deserve for rebelling against God. Jesus is the greatest news that any of us will ever receive. Jesus in my place, Jesus in your place, is the single most selfless act that God ever made. Instead of giving you what you rightly deserve, Jesus took it for you. And although our need for a Savior has a start date, don't, I don't want you to miss this. Although our need for a Savior has a start date, we learn from verse 1 that our Savior, he don't have no start date. It wasn't like God just spoke Jesus into existence when we sinned to be, to, to be the, the, the payment for our sin debt. Jesus has always existed. Our start date for a Savior, it began on Genesis 3, 6, right? But Jesus has always existed. He's co-eternal with God the Father and also God the Holy Spirit. Again, concreting the, this, this notion, this truth, that our sin didn't catch God off guard. He already had a plan in place. And Jesus is not an afterthought. The rebellion of mankind, again, did not catch Jesus off, catch God off guard. And so I want you to take comfort in knowing that God planned for you. 
He made a way for you and I to reconnect to him, but he didn't stop there. Because in verse 2, we learn that we learn just how big of a deal this plan was. It's so big, in fact. It's so needed. It's so mighty. It's so powerful. It's so life-altering that, G, that God starts talking about it way back in the Old Testament. Look at verse number 2 with me. It says, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, he says, see, I am sending my messenger ahead of you. He will prepare your way. A voice crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make his path straight. God was so excited about Jesus coming to save humanity that he starts prophesying through his prophets about a precursor to Jesus some 400 plus years earlier. Someone who would herald Christ's arrival. Someone who would be a precursor or a warm-up act, if you will, to Jesus himself. A person that would prepare the way for people to hear and to receive the Messiah. And this announcement, this news that God was going to send a herald, it started in the Old Testament. Hundreds of years before the herald or Jesus actually arrived on the scene, God uses Isaiah, one of the greatest Old Testament prophets, to prepare the way for the messenger. This is, when I was reading this, this part kind of tripped me up. We all know about John the Baptist for the most part, right? We know that John Baptist, he's screaming out in the wilderness, you know, repent and believe, and he's baptizing folks, and people are getting saved by, by, the, by the dozen, right? By the hundreds, right? We all know that. But for some reason, in, in my small mind, I didn't put two and two together. Jesus was prophesied about coming as the Messiah in the Old Testament, and so was John the Baptist. We see that in Isaiah 40. So important was our Savior coming on the scene. So important was, was our need for a Savior that God saw fit to tell us about the, the, the precursor to Jesus himself. God prophesies about the precursor to Jesus. Why? Why go through all of that fuss? Why, why do all of that, God? I don't know about you, but I forget announcements all the time. I put a little flag on my calendar or my, on my email, and I forget to come back to it all the time. Why would God go through so much trouble? Why would God, why would God trouble Isaiah to prophesy about this issue? Why not just send the messenger at the appointed time and only prophesy about Jesus? Or better yet, why use an announcer at all? I think this is the reason. At least this is what I came down to. So great was our need that God sent a messenger to tell us about his plan. So great was our need for our Savior. So great was our need for salvation that God sent a messenger to tell us about his plan. God didn't leave anything up to chance. He didn't want people speculating about who the Messiah would be. He didn't want people saying, you didn't tell me the Messiah was coming. You know people like that, right? Like you, you, someone has a windfall and then they miss out on the windfall and like, you didn't tell me it was going to be some giveaways at that so-and-so. We know people like that. God wanted people to look forward and anticipate Christ's arrival. He wanted people to long for the Savior. And once Jesus hit the scene, he wanted people to identify Jesus correctly as their long-awaited Messiah, saying, at last, our Savior has arrived. God didn't hide anything from his people then, and he doesn't hide anything from his people now. God reveals what he's doing and what he's working on. And so in his grace, God prepared the way for Jesus by prophesying about a messenger who would come before Christ started his ministry here on the earth. In verse 4, we learn that John, he burst onto the scene, and he's doing some amazing things. He's baptizing people in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Verse 5, it says the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were coming out to him and they were baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. John, also known as John the Baptizer, is um, preaching a two-point sermon entitled Salvation Through Christ Alone. That's his, his sermon over and over again. Salvation through Christ alone. Point number one, you're a sinner. Stop living in sin. Point number two, believe in Jesus and be saved. And he preached the same sermon day in and day out, day in and day out. And then he would take those people who profess faith in Jesus Christ and he would baptize them by submerging them down underneath the water. And this is where we get the concept or the practice of only baptizing believers, people who have professed faith in Jesus Christ. And this is also where we get the act of baptizing people under the water. A great many people heard this message and they were baptized. It says in verse 5 that the whole Judean countryside 
and all the people of Jerusalem, they came to hear John preach, and they got baptized. He's doing the work that God has called him to do out in the wilderness. And because his message was from God, because his message was exactly what people needed to hear in order to be saved, people are drawn to it. They're drawn to the message. It would kind of be like if we were to say, you know what, we're going to just move out of this building and we're going to buy a giant tent. We're going to move down to Harnett County and we're going to just pitch a tent in a field and we're going to have church there. And then people will come from Raleigh and Cary and Chapel Hill and Durham and come have church services there, hear the gospel, get saved, and get baptized. And it would make no sense for that to happen, just like it made no sense for John to have such a great impact that he had. He's out in the middle of nowhere. He's not preaching the Jesus love you sermons. He's not preaching 10 ways to a better life. He's not preaching prosperity. He's telling these people that you have to put your faith in Jesus Christ because if you don't, you're going to die and go to hell. He's the only savior. And you know what's happening? People hear that message. You know what? You're right. They get convicted and they get saved and then they get baptized. And those same people experience that. They take that experience back home to their friends and their family and they bring more folks back. And it keeps happening over and over and over and over again. The people kept coming because John was preaching a message that hadn't been heard. John was preaching the message that the people desperately needed. He's preaching salvation through Christ alone. And so when people come to hear the good news, they can't get enough of it. And they want their friends and their family to experience the exact same thing. I just wonder. I just wonder, what would the church of Jesus Christ look like? I wonder, what would our world look like if more churches actually preached the gospel, pointing people to Jesus Christ instead of themselves? If more church members told their non-believing friends and family members about how Jesus radically impacted their lives, I just wonder what might happen to the Western church. John knew what his mission was, and he didn't care what people thought about him. He lived and he served for an audience of one. And I say that because of how John, how Mark chooses to describe John here in verse number six. It says that John, he's got some pretty interesting clothes on, doesn't he? John, he wore a camel hair garment with a leather belt around his waist and he ate locusts and wild honey. I get the wild honey. I like wild honey, but locusts are not about bugs. They're not about wearing camel hair. It's all itchy and scratchy and everything. John's clothes were, were made by his own hands. And the man, he ate bugs, and he, he, he also consumed wild honey. I think what God wants us to know about John is that in addition to being a faithful preacher of the gospel, John also lived a modest life. He wasn't motivated by stuff or popularity. God used this obscure man to prepare the way for Jesus by preaching the gospel and baptizing believers. I would think, I think rather, that it would serve us well to take two examples from John's life and we're going to move on. The first thing I want you guys to hold on to and never let go of regarding John's life is this, is to be faithful. Be faithful. Do the work the Lord Lord assigns to you. Do it faithfully. John was sent into the wilderness to preach a two-point sermon. Believe and repent. Believe and repent. Think about the various roles that you have been assigned to. If you're a mother, if you're a student, if you're a child, if you're a worker, if you're a retiree, think about the various roles, the various stages of life that God has assigned to you. And as you think about those things, ask yourself a question, am I being faithful in these roles? As in, am I consistently, day in and day out, with passion, serving my Lord through these roles? Am I focused on making sure that I do these things to the very best of my ability? Whatever you do, do it faithfully. Remember, it's not about you. Rather, it's about God's glory and your fellow man. Christians are servants. We serve God and others. Secondly, we learn from John to be humble. You're not that important. I'm not that important. We're not that important. Be humble. Given the number of people that John baptized and the fact that more and more people keep coming out to him each and every day and the fact that now he has his own following, I think it'd be really easy for John to get the big head, to think that he's the reason why people are coming, to think that he deserves to get some glory and some accolades, that he deserves to get some some special treatment. 
Remember, John came to point people to the main attraction. And despite all these people who are coming out in, in, in by, by the hundreds to hear his message, John didn't fall victim to his own hype like so many people in leadership have in times past, believing that because of their position, because of their prestige, because of who they are, they deserve to be treated pe- special and living by this secret set of rules that none of us are allowed to live by. When I was writing this sermon, I thought about this article I read over the summer. It was about this, this county commissioner in Florida, um, and I, th- I forget his name, um, what is his name? I should just tell you so you can laugh too. Joe Mullen is his name. So Joe Mullen has his cherry red um, uh, Ferrari, and he's flying down Interstate 95. He's doing 92 miles per hour down Interstate 95. Some of you might have even heard this story. He gets pulled over, and he says to the police officer, I run this county. What are you doing pulling me over? As if to say the speed limit doesn't apply to old Joe, right? And it wouldn't be so bad, but the guy had been pulled over multiple times for doing the exact same thing and saying the exact same thing, thinking that he deserves a pass because he's a county commissioner. Don't be like Joe. Instead, be like John. His success didn't change who he was. Humility permeated his heart. He was humble in appearance, humble in living, humble in his words. The man literally said, there is one coming whose shoestrings I'm unworthy to untie. You know what John says is saying there? He says, I don't even deserve to untie Jesus' dirty shoes and take them off, let alone to prepare the way for him. And we think about dirty shoes, like, oh, you got a scuff mark or it's a little bit dirt on top. No, 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 no. In John's day, they wore sandals. And most of the time, they're walking on dirt roads. And it wasn't just humans walking on dirt roads, but it's also animals walking on those dirt roads. And what happens when an animal has to relieve themselves? They go off to the side of the road? No, 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 no. They, go, they drop it like it's hot right there. And so John is saying, I'm not even fit to untie soil, filthy shoes that Jesus has on his feet. So great was our need for the Savior that God sent a messenger to tell us about his plan. And John, thank the Lord for John, he faithfully proclaimed the gospel of Jesus Christ, helping to win countless souls to the Lord. Yet despite, the most, despite being the most popular preacher in the land, John remained humble. He kept on pointing people to the one who was yet to come. In addition, John knew that his success came from God working through him. And the same is true for us. Here's the application piece. John understood that his success came from God working through him. Here's our last observation. I want you always to remember that, remember that you're merely conducting power. Jesus is the actual power source. In verse 8, all those are a lot, there's a lot of different variations of what this verse means. Most directly, verse 8, this is what it says, this is what it means. He says, John says, I baptize you with water, but he, being Jesus, will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. With this single statement, John is saying that apart from God, he is powerless. If God had not empowered him to minister in the wilderness, nobody would have gotten saved. So John is saying, I'm a lowly messenger that's been plugged into the message, the power source. All that I say, all that I do, it comes from the power of God working through me. I don't have the power. But when Jesus comes, he will be both the source of power and the message of salvation itself. Jesus is the full embodiment of the gospel message. In him is both conviction and redemption. In other words, Jesus will grab your heart and save your soul simultaneously. There's not going to be any lag. There's not going to be any power loss. There's not going to be any room for confusion. When Jesus steps on the scene, the time to see, hear, and respond to him will be immediate. It will be now. And there's no one greater to wait for than Jesus himself. He is the foretold Messiah. He's the God-man. John doesn't want anyone to get it twisted. He doesn't want anyone that came to hear him to leave thinking that he's the Messiah or that he has some type of supernatural powers or that he's a supernatural being himself. All that John has done is through the work of the Holy Spirit coursing through his veins. It's kind of like the, the, the power lines that cross our city, that bring electricity into our homes and our businesses. So it is with us. God works through us, transmitting help to people that need it most. We are powerless 
conductors, just like this wrapped up extension cord. Have you ever thought about this before? We are just powerless conductors. There's no power in us. In essence, we are just transmitting power from one place to the next place. We don't have power. We just merely are used by God to bring the power from here to over there. And so something amazing happens when we get saved, we plug into the power source. And that's the Holy Spirit. He gives us ability and he gives us wisdom. He gives us discernment. He gives us all these amazing things. The Holy Spirit flows through us into the lives of other people. We're merely just extension cords. So let's say Shelly has a problem and she's confided in us. How is God going to bless her? Nine times out of ten, he's going to work through other people to bless her. And so he'll notify us or she'll share that. And God will press on our hearts and say, hey, go be a blessing to Shelly. Go take care of what she has problems with. Connect her with the right people. And we just simply take our power and we just connect it to Shelly. And really and truly, it's not us anymore, but rather is now God blessing her. John, can y'all see this little light? I tried to find the best one I could. There's my Holy, there's my Holy Spirit light. <laughs> of course, he's way bigger than that. But This is how John saw his ministry. He saw his ministry as being one who just takes power from one place and, and, and conducts it to another place. He didn't want any credit. He didn't want any accolades. He didn't want any praise. He wanted to make sure that he fulfilled his job perfectly. And so here's the question that's on the table. How good is your connection to the power source? Are you plugged into the right source? Because, you know, you know, there's different voltages, right? You got 120, you got 220, you got, what's it, you got four what? 277. 277. You got all these different voltages, right? And if you plug into the wrong source, you might blow some stuff up or you might not have enough power. Are you plugged into the right power source? Are you plugged in at all? Is your cord damaged? If it is, then today is a good time, a good opportunity for you to recommit to the Lord. God sent John into the world to prepare the way for people to know that Jesus was coming so that when Jesus arrived on the scene, people could profess faith in him because John had warmed the people up already. Let's not forget that God prepared the way for you to receive the gospel before you knew what the gospel was or even realized that you needed it. That's how much our God loves you. From the very beginning, he had a plan, and his name, the plan's name was Jesus. And so great was our need that God sent his messenger to tell us about his plan. God didn't keep any secrets. He was kind of like a, a first-time parent, just couldn't hold it, couldn't keep it. Jesus' messenger did his work faithfully and humbly. And like John, never forget that it's not us doing the work, but it's God working through us. Let's get ready to see Jesus. Let's stay ready to see Jesus and be influenced by him, not just today, but always. Join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for planning our salvation in advance. I thank you, Lord, for thinking about us enough that you decided to send Jesus Christ to die on the cross for our sins. Thank you, Lord, for notifying us through John the Baptist here in your written word and also for those people who lived during the days of John the Baptist. Thank you for sending that precursor to the Messiah. Thank you for keeping your promise and actually sending Jesus. We're not waiting for the Messiah. The Messiah has come. Thank you for causing us to believe in you. Thank you for forgiving us of our sins. Thank you for promising to forgive us of our future sins as we confess those. Lord, I, I pray, Lord, that today that people would leave here thinking more highly of you. I pray, Lord, that people would see you more clearly. And I pray, Lord, that people would leave here, including myself, more inspired to share the message, to prepare the, prepare the way for other people to respond yes to your gospel, just like John the Baptist did. Lord, create in us a clean heart and renew our minds, O oh Lord. Help us to think on you throughout the remainder of this week. And God, I ask that you would give us peace to accept what we cannot change. Courage to change what should be changed and give us wisdom and discernment to, to tell the difference one from another. Again, we thank you, God. You alone are good. In Jesus' name, amen.